Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the ALF Stanway Lecture in Missions, presented to you by the Ridley College Public Lectures Series. Uh, the lectures are a series of public lectures in the fields of biblical studies and Christian thought for lifelong learning. My name is Brian Rosner and I'm the principal of the college. It's my pleasure to introduce the dynamic duo delivering tonight's lecture, Robert and Linda Banks. Robert Banks has held teaching positions in universities and theological colleges in Australia and overseas, including Professor of the Ministry of the Laity and Director of the Dupree Leadership Centre at Fuller Seminary in LA. He's also an award-winning author of many books covering a broad field, including Biblical Studies, Christian Community, Faith and Work, Lifestyle and Leadership, Apologetics and Film. Of interest to tonight's presentation, two of those books focus on mission, uh, The Church Comes Home, and the volume on re-envisioning re theological education. Linda Banks has a background in teaching and was a staff worker at the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students. She's also been associate pastor in both Anglican and Baptist churches and a chaplain at Macquarie University. With Robert, she's made several visits to China, and they've spoken at universities, theological colleges, the United Bible Society, and the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences Bible in China seminar. I'm a longstanding admirer of their work over many years, and as it turns out, Rob gave me my first job in teaching in Australia back in 2000 at Macquarie University, the uh, MCSI department in those days, and Linda was a valued colleague there. So it's, uh, uh, it's uh, personally a great pleasure for me to introduce them tonight. The theme of their lecture is the influence of Australian women missionaries in shaping modern China. It offers a window into the personal lives and lasting legacy of several prominent CMS missionaries, especially from our state, Victoria, during a half century of outstanding service from 1900 to 1950. So over to you, Rob and Linda. During our first visit to China in 2012, Rob and I sought to walk in the footsteps of our grand aunt, Sophie Newton, who was a CMS missionary in Fuchao for 35 years. On the next trip, we learned that in her later years, Sophie had adopted two children whose parents were so poor that they found it impossible to raise them. The son had a daughter, Ma Rong, who amazingly was still alive and eager to meet us. Now 90 years old, she called Sophie Grandma and shared stories about her that were unknown to us. After several hours over a meal, we felt free to, she felt free to tell us that all through the hard times, I had kept the faith in my heart. A year later, during our third visit, she gathered her entire extended family, around two dozen people, most of them Christians, to meet us. They brought food and drink, we exchanged gifts and heard many more stories. At the final group goodbye, she said in words that still ring in our ears, if grandma had not adopted my father and aunt, none of these people here would have existed not even one. This very personal story, family story, is an apt introduction to our topic. We would like to thank CMS Victoria, St Andrews Hall and Ridley College for the opportunity to talk about something that is very close to our own hearts. We also want to acknowledge Bishop Alfred Stanway, who we both heard in the 1970s and we're very impressed by for his passion and his spiritual depth. We've chosen our topic partly because women made up over 80% of all CMS missionaries who served in China from just before 1900 to 1950, and be partly because of the growing importance of China to Australia today. Mm -hmm. Most of us of these were single women who often worked in more remote and difficult situations. Living through the Boxer Uprising, clashes between provincial warlords and Japanese invasion, and civil war between nationalists and communists, they suffered the same hardships as the people around them. Many were shot at and bombed, endured capture 
and imprisonment and risked their lives to save others. Some were even killed. What follows, rather like a multi-course Chinese banquet, (laughs) draws particularly on the stories of nine CMS missionaries, the majority of whom came from or trained in Victoria. To set the scene, you'll see a missionary map coming up of China, which is helpful in identifying where these women served. Its naming of provinces follows usage at the time. Most of them worked in Fukien, which you'll see across the straits from Formosa, which we now call Taiwan. A couple worked in Chekiang, the adjoining province just to the north. One other worked in Kwangsi, two provinces to the west, and another in Sichuan, in the middle of the far west of the country, bordering Tibet. A snapshot of CMS Australian involvement in 1900, just near the start of our period, comes from a report by the Secretary of CMS Victoria to the Bishop of Tasmania. It described the work of 16 missionaries, only one of whom was male. I quote, The work carried on by these missionaries is of various kinds. Some are engaged in schoolwork, including an orphanage. Others itinerate, speaking as they have opportunity in the towns and villages through which they pass. Others devote their time entirely to instructing Chinese ladies in their homes. Others, again, are engaged in training native Christians for work as Bible women and as teachers. Workers in China have many difficulties. Almost everywhere, they are greeted with the epithet foreign devils, and at times the violence of the mob becomes alarming. The weakness arises chiefly from the government, which is frequently unable to cope with the violence of armed bands of rebels. Occasionally these mobs are instigated by the literati. One may ask, what are these 16 among the millions of China? End of quote. In this lecture, we'll look at five foundational areas of Australian women's missionary work that influenced the emergence of modern China. The first area of influence was changing women's lives and training Bible women. Changing women's lives and Bible women, training Bible women. The first Australians to go to China with CMS Victoria were Eleanor and Elizabeth Saunders from Melbourne. They grew up under the influence of the Reverend J.B. McCartney at St. Hilary's Kew and were just in their early 20s when they sailed to China. After completing language study, they began to evangelise in the mountainous district of Kucheng with the aid of a Chinese Christian woman. When they walked into into a village, the custom was that they would be welcomed into a home into which other local women were invited, with husbands sometimes eavesdropping outside the doors and windows. Eleanor wrote, It seems so strange to these women to think that there is a God who cares for them, that they can't understand it at all at first. Some indeed, most of them, are not at all happy. They have never known what it is for anyone to really love them or care much about their welfare. The missionaries found that the the women's lives were dominated often by fear of evil spirits, whom they sought, the the people sought to fend off by doing things like embroidering tiger's heads on children's bibs and shoes, by placing nets over windows and doors to entangle the spirits, or since girls weren't really worth much bothering about, by giving girls, uh, giving girls, boys, girls' names to deceive the ghosts. People also sought to gain protection through food offerings, gifts, money, etc., to idols in their homes, in temples and in processions. To, create a bar- uh, to avoid creating a barrier for their message among poor villagers, the two sisters also dressed and fed themselves and lived in, in as simple as way as possible. Quote, The Chinese Christians are very poor, Eleanor wrote. 
It is the same here as it was in the days when Jesus himself was on earth. The common people heard him gladly. And you feel that there must be nothing in your house or in your style of living that makes them think you are very rich. When village women responded to the gospel, they were prepared for baptism by missionaries. Knowing now that they were daughters of God, forgiven by Christ and empowered by his spirit, such women began to see themselves as more than providers of meals, Mm. field workers or bearers of male heirs. They gained a much larger vision of what marriage was about, began to care more for their neighbours and develop skills that could, could be put to work outside their own home. This significantly enhanced the status of the ordinary woman in a way that had previously um, been unknown and only experienced by a small number of high-class ladies in Chinese society. Mm. One of the key objectives of these mission stations was to prepare some female converts to become what they called Bible women. Uh, These were evangelists and distributors of Christian literature in their own and in nearby villages. They also helped male catechists to start churches, which also had Bible studies and Sunday schools. To prepare for this work, you had to attend a three-month, full-time, residential women's training school in the mission compound. Two Australian missionaries who headed up such schools were Martha Clark from St. Columns Hawthorne, who served in Ningbo, Chekiang province, and Sophie Newton, our grand aunt, who was an ordained deaconess from the Sydney Diocese. She worked in the district of Lien Kong in Fukien province. Both of these found persuading women's husbands to let them attend the training school is very difficult. The men generally described their wives as the one at the back of the house (laughs) who should devote themselves solely to their and their children's needs. Husbands would only consent if they saw a financial advantage in not supporting their wife for several months or felt it would be useful to have a wife who had learned to read and write. Even when they gave consent, they often recall their wives halfway through the course. In Sophie's school, for example, women learn the Ten Commandments, Lord's Prayer and Apostles' Creed, as well as a hundred biblical passages that summed up the Christian message. At first, she continued to reside with her fellow missionaries in the women's house during the course, but uh, in later years chose to live in with the uh, Bible women eating meals together, relaxing with each other, and even sleeping in the same dormitory. By the end of her and Martha Clark's time in China, each had trained around 500 Bible women through their schools. And at that time, these women, some of them were beginning to be ordained as deaconesses like Sophie herself. In fact, she said they too were called by God committed to giving their lives for their sisters in China. The impact of these Bible women upon the church in China overall was extensive. During the early 1900s, they were the main agents of conversion of women and some men, and also a revival amongst the people. From the 1930s, they influenced the next generation of male Christian Chinese pastors and helped make the church more self-governing. From the 1950s, they helped sustain the survival of Christianity in China and, when many male pastors were imprisoned, stepped into leadership roles in the church. The second area of influence was challenging the customs of infanticide and footbinding. In general, CMS missionaries were encouraged to respect traditional Chinese customs However, sometimes they felt compelled to challenge those that cause physical harm, such as infanticide of female babies and girls. Since the Chinese dowry system mainly viewed girls as an economic liability rather than asset, 
Poor families often abandoned them immediately after birth. Some were left in public places in the hope that a passerby might take pity on them. Others were abandoned in ditches along roadsides or exposed in fields in the countryside. Many were posted in so-called pillar boxes Mm. or deposited in baby towers above a river which flushed their little bodies downstream. All our women missionaries sought to dissuade families with whom they were in contact to actually forsake this practice. In a number of cases, any babies found by CMS missionaries were placed in a baby orphanage called the Bird's Nest, Mm. and the children were called birdies, Mm. which was run by an Australian, um, Aidan Nisbet, um, in Kuching. Some girls were not abandoned, but instead betrothed for a sum of money to boys or older men as prospective husbands. This made money for the family. The belief was that young girls were more sexually attractive and fertile if their feet were bound. And so around five years old, major bones in the feet were broken, then rebroken, and then forced into specially made lotus shoes that were painful and limited the distance that these girls and then women could walk. Only in a few cases in China was this practice challenged. In the late uh, 1880s, an anti-footbinding society was formed in Shanghai. In the 1900s, some magistrates, Confucian and Buddhist leaders began a united movement. And in 1902, the Dowager Empress published a decree against it. While these initiatives slowly gained influence amongst higher-class women in cities, they made little difference to behaviour in the countryside. Women missionaries found this custom abhorrent, but also saw its overthrow as a symbol of persons of a person's freedom in Christ for those who accepted the gospel. The approach they took was first to talk privately with people about it in their converts' homes, also to openly encourage inquirers to discard it, but in time to refuse to enrol girls in their mission schools unless their parents unbound their feet. When in 1908, partly due to the influence of Chinese Christians in Fukien's Provincial Assembly, a National Foot Society was established. Authorities and missionaries worked together against the practice. But it was not until the new republic, under the guidance of Sun Yat-sen, himself a Christian, was established in 1912 that footbinding eventually began to die out. Our third point, um, the third area of influence, was caring for the blind and for orphans. Caring for the blind and orphans. In the 19th century, Chinese children were noticeably more prone to blindness. There were various reasons for that, um, among them a widespread uh, vitamin A deficiency, but also a higher incidence of glaucoma, congenital cataracts and measles. Lack of adequate medical treatment escalated the problem. Out of shame, children inflicted with blindness were generally hidden away or sometimes abandoned. Others were sold to middlemen who promoted them as fortune tellers or trained them as musical performers. But many became little more than beggars and often the source of ridicule, particularly in remote areas. Yeah. Amy Oxley a teacher and nurse from Sydney who attended the Marsden Training Home, was the first missionary to go to China with CMS New South Wales. She was the senior missionary in Lian Kong, in Fuchao, near Fuchao, opening a dispensary that was soon treating up to 150 patients a day. One day on her rounds, she came across a helpless blind boy who had been abandoned in a ditch by his father. Maybe not his fault. After talking um, uh, with the boy, she took him in. God gave her a vision for helping those who, as she put it, 
were not only blind of God's beautiful world around them, but of heaven's own light. Amy taught herself Braille, began translating parts of the Bible into the local dialect, and founded the first of of the blind schools in Fukien, which she named the Soul Lighted School. School. Its curriculum ran from kindergarten right through to adulthood, including development of life skills so students could become productive workers and as weavers, furniture makers, teachers of the blind and mm-hmm. piano tuners. Building on the tradition of blind street musicians, she started a fantastic brass band that was invited to play at important ceremonies in the province. Amy also helped a blind, blind girls' school start um, under Emily Stevens, who was also a missionary from Victoria. In 1910, the central government invited Amy's school to display its literary skills and commercial products at the International Nanking Exhibition, where it won several medals, Mm -hmm. as well as at the 1915 International Panama Exhibition, representing China. During this time, she she also helped her British doctor husband turn the small uh, infirmary next door to the blind school into a major hospital, which is now the second largest hospital in Fuzhou, in Fuzhou as it was. Meanwhile, the late, a leading Confucian literati and business groups in Fuzhou petitioned the local and central governments to recognise her work. As a result, in 1920, a major parade throughout the whole city was organised in her mm-hmm. honour and she was awarded the most <laughs> distinguished medal a foreigner could receive at the time the Order of the Golden Grain, and it was presented by the the President of the Republic. Another outcast group in Chinese society was orphans. These were mostly boys left to fend for themselves by impoverished, war-ravaged or famine-stricken famine-stricken families. Nora Dillon came from Sydney but was trained at the Melbourne Bible Institute. She first served as an evangelist in Lim Chao, Guangxi province in South China, then worked with the Chinese church in Hong Kong, after which she was appointed matron of the Taipo Orphanage on the Kowloon Peninsula just before the outbreak of World War II. When the Japanese actually captured Hong Kong, Nora was allowed to continue the orphanage rather than being interned in a prison camp, uh, a rare uh, a rare thing, mm. even though a company of soldiers was quartered in some of its buildings. And for the next four years, she protected female students from potentially predatory soldiers, grew and scrounged food for the orphans to avoid them starving, mm. and despite a ban on religious instruction, continued to teach them the Christian faith. As a result of her work, all the orphans were kept safe and well until Hong Kong was finally liberated by the American Navy. Amazing woman. (laughs) Our fourth area of influence was um, curing illnesses and drug addiction. Curing illnesses and drug addiction. Traditional uh, Chinese medicine in the early 20th century was limited in its ability to treat illness and only reached a very small proportion of people, really. So mission societies were able to step into this gap, especially amongst the poor. Since men were not permitted to treat women, it was through dispensaries run by women that Western medicine first reached such people. Mm-hmm. Our women's contribution took place primarily in villages or by serving in hospitals in larger centres. Dispensaries dealt with the everyday illnesses that people suffered and also were used as um, places for triage for people who needed to be hospitalised later on. Mm -hmm. Initially, villages were suspicious of anything that wasn't Chinese medicine, but word gradually spread that foreign medicine could do some pretty wonderful things. While patients were waiting for treatment, a Bible woman would chat with them about their own personal circumstances and either tell or through the magic lantern uh, pictures 
um, show biblical stories. Rhoda Watkins trained at the Adelaide Hospital but did her missionary preparation at St Hilda's home in Melbourne. In 1922, she was appointed to the Way of Life Hospital in Kuei Lin, mm -hmm. South China. As well as assisting the female missionary doctor, Rhoda was responsible for supervising dispensaries in the wider district. She structured these very much to promote personal hygiene as well as provide antiseptics, anaesthetics and vaccines. It was when people were struck down by the regular outbreaks of malaria, cholera or typhoid that the work of the missionaries was often made, often made the greatest impression. Recurrent epidemics of cholera were particularly devastating. In packed and cramped conditions, hundreds would fall sick quickly and suffer the most horrible pain. Glands became swollen, hands, nose, lips and fingers turned black and death could come in a few days. Rhoda and a few Chinese nurses under her care were usually first on the scene when an epidemic occurred, sometimes visiting sick in their homes with apparent unconcern for their own safety. In the early 1940s, Rhoda became matron of the Way of Life Hospital, and from the beginning, she worked hard to embed a culture of care in every aspect, of Christian care in every aspect of the work. Mm. This established a model, very important, a model for Chinese nurses and doctors that influenced them wherever they went on to serve. After the Japanese um, repeatedly bombed and then attacked the city, she was forced to flee, one of the last inhabitants to do so. On her return after the war, Rhoda spent the next three years rebuilding the shattered remains of the hospital, sometimes by her own hand, um, restoring it to a central place in the life of the city and staying until the communists finally ordered all missionaries to leave the country. A very important aspect of women's contribution to health in China was dealing with drug addiction. Mm. Opium use had increased since British traders introduced it from India in the 1850s. By our missionaries' time, addiction was endemic and resulted in too many families becoming destitute. Our Australian women supported Christian wives who were trying to break their husband's habit, yeah. as well as, of course, providing help for those going through withdrawal in their dispensaries and hospitals. When an anti-opium society was formed by scholar officials in Fu Chao in 1907, missionaries completely affirmed it and publicly supported a 10,000-strong citywide protest against growing and importing poppies. This led to public burnings of the drug and to the closing of many hundreds of dens in the capital. Missionaries, both Australian and British, women as well as men, put pressure upon England to cease exporting opium to China, though it took 10 years for them to convince mm. the government to do this. Yeah. When the Anti-Opium Society extended its work into rural areas, including Sophie Newton's own district, she and her fellow missionaries supported a public meeting in a city temple that was attended by mandarins, city elders, school teachers and a large crowd. Along with just a few other people, on the speaker's platform, she was invited as the senior missionary in the district to address the gathering. She did this and afterwards, together with the local pastor, met with city elders to develop a plan to open, open uh, opium curing centres, to officially visit every house in the city, seeking to persuade people to give up the drug, to send deputations throughout the whole district and to provide communal as well as spiritual support. On another occasion, Sophie arranged a missionary doctor who happened to be Amy Oxley's husband to help all the men of the village detox together. <laughs> this was a pattern that was replicated in several other villages in the province. 
And so our fifth and final area of influence was providing girls and women's education, providing girls and women's education. According to a well-known Chinese proverb, it is a virtue for a woman to remain ignorant. In villages, since parents regarded girls first as field workers and then as marriage collateral, educating them was considered a waste of time and money. Even in more well-to-do homes, only a minority um, allowed girls to be tutored alongside boys. As government schools were almost exclusively only for boys, it was mission societies who who largely opened up the possibility of girls' education. Mm. Several of our women were involved in this, including Eliza Clark from St Collins Hawthorne, who, like her identical twin sister, Martha, was educated at Tinton Grammar and then trained at St Hilda's Home in Melbourne. Eliza's girls' school was in the city port of Ningbo, Chekiang province, and was for both boarders and day students. It taught history, geography, arithmetic, basic science, studied the Bible and Chinese classics, and taught domestic skills. Its goal, which might seem unusual to us, but its goal was to develop wives for Christian husbands, who, as well as raising a family, could have a ministry outside the home, very important, such as teaching in day schools, opening a small dispensary from their home, or becoming a Bible woman. A further step, women's education was pioneered by Victoria Manette in the province of Sichuan, Western China. She had graduated from the University of Melbourne and also prepared at St Hilda's Training Home. During her first term of service as principal of Mianyang uh, Girls School, she introduced the training of older students to help younger ones and started a senior school to prepare students to attend the new Christian university. This university was set up by five mission societies, including CMS, who Victoria, amongst one or two others, represented in discussions. At the girls' school, she ensured students had a good knowledge of the new Chinese Republic. The annual anniversary of the Republic was celebrated with an address, national hymn, and a prayer and was attended by civic authorities, military officials, and prominent women in the city. We felt, she said, that we should help them know what love of God and true love for one's country meant. Several years later, Victoria was appointed as a lecturer in the West China Union University, the Christian University, possibly the first woman anywhere in China to hold such an important position. According to a colleague, she was committed to educating women and men with sympathy, insight, tact, and avoidance of any kind of superiority complex. (laughs) I wish I could have met her. She taught courses in education, science, and scripture, and was appointed a faculty representative on the Women's College, but also the University Senate. But Victoria also held open house for students many of whom came from non-Christian homes, on Saturdays for refreshments and games, on Sundays for lunch and discussion after church, where she sought to be a friend and an advisor, as well as a teacher. Over the next few years, women graduates began to take up positions in the province and elsewhere as teachers, nurses, church workers, and the university's innovative policies and practices had an impact on educational reform in other universities in China. And so we ask the question, um, as quite a bit of time now has passed and all of these women that we've talked about to you have died um, and the communist victory in China is 70 70 years old. Mm, 75. 75 years old. Are there any um, tangible traces of Australian women missionaries and their work that still exists today? Sadly, along with seven other missionaries and two children, the Saunders sisters were massacred and their bodies burned in 1895 during a pre-Boxer uprising 
sometimes called the Kuchang Massacre. While this tragedy was expected to inhibit women offering as missionaries, over the next decade, it exponentially increased their number. As a result of the massacre, the Kuching district in Fukien became a vibrant centre of Christian faith and mission for many, many years mm. to come. For a time, it was the base of Watchman Me and is also the place from which the present senior pastor of the largest 10,000 strong, yes, you heard me right, 10,000 strong church in Fuchiao comes. In fact, one result of CMS's influence in Fukien, in which Australian women were overrepresented, um, really, um, is that now 15% of the province's population are Christian. The actual mission compound Sophie Newton helped develop in the Yen Kong still exists, somewhat extraordinarily. We've been there. <laughs> We've been there. While only two dilapidated buildings survive, its legacy continues through a newer four-storey building that houses the official church's district headquarters. It has a chapel, meeting spaces, dining room, kitchen, offices, and short-term accommodation. The crumbling women's house is being turned into a city museum, which will include the history of its missionaries. In fact, one or two of our books. In the district of Liang Kong itself, there is also a network of around 250 home congregations, mm -hmm. many of whose origins lie in village churches, which Sophie and her colleagues first helped to get going. After the communist victory, Amy Oxley Wilkinson's Blind Boy School was merged with the Blind Girl School in Fu Chao. Though now under government administration, Amy continues to be honoured as its founder. Her picture is on the outside of part of the school and several Christians have been involved in its operation. In fact, in the 1990s, President Xi Jinping organised for money um, during the time when he was the secretary of Fuzhou's Municipal Party Committee money to be given to the building of the new larger campus. Mm -hmm. In 20, uh, 2017, along with Amy's great-granddaughter, we were welcomed and honoured guest at its annual International White Cane Day, a great honour for us. When the orphanage that Nora Dillon led throughout the war in Hong Kong was sold in the 1960s, Proceeds there were used to radically expand its work under the name of St Christopher's Home. This large Anglican network is the largest non-government welfare agency presently in Hong Kong. It cares for children through small group homes, pre-primary education, children's health development, and support for recently arrived homeless children from mainland China. Since Rhoda Watkins left China, the Way of Life Hospital has grown, moved, and but remained the leading maternity and children's hospital in Kuailin. <laughs> in 2010, it commemorated its 100th anniversary and was the subject of a program on Chinese TV and an illustrated book. Rhoda is also included in the Women's Museum of Australia in Alice Springs mm -hmm. as one of the pioneering women who contributed to our own country's development. After the Communist Revolution, Eliza Clark's girls' school was merged with a, another college on the mission compound to become a co-educational institution. We've not been there, but we've been informed that it later developed into what is now the number three high school in the city. Though her sister Martha's women's Bible school ceased after she returned home in 1947, women church workers and women pastors are now trained in significant numbers at the nearby Hangzhou Theological Seminary. Victoria Manette's pioneering work in Sichuan continues in the province to this day. Her school in Mianyang is now the leading middle school in the city. 
The Christian University in Chengdu, now Sichuan University, has become one of the finest campuses in China. Mm-hmm. This was a, has a highly regarded institute um, of religion, the oldest institute for higher learning of its kind in China. Yeah. The university now has as many women students as men and attracts a large number of international students. In conclusion, <laughs> we have a wonderful final quote from a study entitled Missionary Women in China, Changing China, Changing Themselves. Quote, missionary women went to China to preach the gospel, but also they helped transform Chinese culture and society, especially for Chinese women. Through the missionary schools, hospitals and other social agencies, missionaries became sources of alternate, more modern models of development. They exposed the Chinese to a wide range of Western cultural values that often conflicted with indigenous values such as Confucianism. At times when the transmission of new ideas and institutions were supported by the Chinese government, the missionaries initiated significant changes in China that Chinese reformers completed. While women missionaries influenced China, the Chinese affected the women missionaries too. Women missionaries initiated changes in response to the injustice and sufferings they saw, especially of children and women. At times, their affinity and empathy for the Chinese caused women missionaries to assume new roles of independence and leadership. End of quote. This was something they could not have done to the same extent or sometimes at all if they had stayed in Australia. Missionary women had opportunities to preach in chapels, in churches and public spaces to found, manage and lead and lead large and small institutions and to support campaign and serve social reform. In helping to shape modern China, they were in turn shaped themselves and experienced opportunities that still lay well into the future for most Australian women. Thank you. Thank you.